Hi, good afternoon, welcome. Um, yeah, it's cold. We're running with about a 30 second delay on this today. So I'm hoping that when you tell me you're here, you post your questions, that I will be able to see them in time so I don't actually skip across them and go on to the next thing. So let me give you a quick rundown of what we're planning to do in this session. A um, couple of to cut, first of all, just want to say some thank yous. Then I'm going to run through a little bit about you know why we measure retention using survival analysis and what that would look like if you were doing uh, something similar within your business. Um, the topic for the behavioural change component of today's session is going to be looking at um, what did I say I was going to do? Cognitive dissonance. And then I've got two questions, one that popped up in the group um, that I have already answered, but I'm going to answer here as well. And then one from uh, Anushka, who I spoke to earlier today, can't be on the call at this time. So we, we, I've recorded it for you. So that's what we're up to today. It should be 20 to 30 minutes long, um, whether you're watching it live or you're watching it on the catch up. Don't forget to put your comments in. And again, if you want to ask me questions, put questions in the comments and I will get back to you as quick as I can. OK, so first of all, I want to say a couple of thank yous. And the first thank you I want to say is to Health Club Management or HCM. They've given us great coverage this month um, on the retention convention. Good few pages. I think it's five or six pages in total talking about uh, or highlighting the content of the, the event we did back in December. So thank you for them for featuring us in the magazine. And if you would like to subscribe to a digital copy of that, um, we'll put the link in this week to the magazine. And you don't just get that magazine, you get it every month. The other one I want to say thank you to is uh, Fitness Management International. Fitness Management International is a German publication. I was interviewed by some of their team um, just a few weeks ago. And we plan to do quite a short interview. It ended up being quite a long interview. And so they've split it into two, two different articles. But if you read German, it's in there. Again, two or three pages of content. Um, I don't read German. Um, but I do have a lot of German friends. And hopefully they'll tell me that it all makes sense. So thank you to those. I'd also like to welcome all those people who've joined the group since last week. Um, not so many this week. And in fact, I think we've actually said no to more people than we've said yes to. We're getting a lot of requests from people that ha seem to have been members of more groups than they have friends. Um, so we're filtering those out. You're only going to get in if we think you're relevant to the group. So welcome to those people who've joined this week. Um, so those are the topics. Going to run through those fairly quickly now. Starting with measuring retention. Now, one of the things we do for a lot of our clients is we measure the retention within their business and we measure what we call a retention rate. That's the proportion of people, people still paying at any given time period after they've joined, i.e. a three month retention rate, the proportion of people still paying after three months. And what we do is we use um, an approach called survival analysis to do to do this type of work. It's a fairly standard practice within statistics. It's the measurement of a behavior after time. So in our our examples would be a join date and an end date or a join date and a last visit date. And we use that information to plot charts and those charts inform us about the challenges that are currently going on within the business. So let me show you a typical one. So again, I'm always going to use the example of a thousand members just because it makes life easy to understand. So up the vertical axis, what you have is the proportion of people still members. So that's zero to 100 percent. Then across the bottom axis, you have the or the horizontal axis, you have the months since joining. Now, we don't do January, February, March because people join at different times of the year. So we will always measure time since joining. We can break that down and I'll show you some examples of where, how or how we might do that. <coughs> but typically we would just measure it in this way. Now, what you can see here is 
a, a fairly typical retention curve. And within that retention curve, what you're seeing is how quickly people are dropping off. And you can see in this one that you've got people that have obviously joined and even as quickly as at the end of month one, they're dropping out. And that uh, doesn't accelerate. It pretty much stays the same rate week after week after week, right the way through to month 12, where you'll see a bit of a cliff. That cliff usually indicates to us those people who at the end of 12 month memberships or paid in full memberships. And then you see what the renewal rate is into the second year. Now, while I'm calling this a thousand memberships, this was actually a study we did on the Australian fitness market. And I think we were 2000 records short of a million uh, with over 800 clubs contributing. So this was a really big study and we had data for 36 months. And one of the reasons we usually try and keep, you know, we try and get somewhere between three and four years worth of data because we're looking for the recent trends. Yes, that doesn't take into account people who've been there much longer, but we're wanting to look at what's happening right, well, what we call right now within the last two or three years. Um, we have run analysis up to 20 years long. Um, what it does is it just drags that tail out longer and longer with just smaller changes in percentage. But when you do this type of analysis, what it allows you to do is it allows you to work out a number of different things. So we can start reporting in this example that 65% of customers make it through to 12 months. Now, what's interesting is if you take out all the paid in falls, only 60% continue beyond, sorry, only 50%, I should say 55%, not 65%. My bad, 55% of customers make it through to 12 months. And then you can see it declining after that. But it allows us, these types of measures allow us to look at the profile of that curve and then start to plan our interventions based on the shape because different shape curves require different interventions. We can also split that data then. And here's an example of where we might, we've split it by gender and we've got male and female clients. And what you can see here is that obviously within this operator, and this was a 42 month study, you can see that the operator seems to be better at holding on to male members after the first three months than it is female members. So there must be something that's going on during the early stages of membership that's impacting the female membership of this club that doesn't seem to be impacting the male members. But you can see that after the first three months, even though there is that gap, it pretty much stays consistent so by the time you get to about six months, you can see that actually the rate at which men and women leaving is pretty much the same. You get a pretty much the same drop off at 12 months. And then those two lines continue equally apart right the way through, well, beyond three years. So this might be something that you look at in terms of having a strategy to change the way you look after your female customers. We've certainly done work in the past where we worked with an operator. And one of the things we were able to identify by using these types of charts was that their young female customers didn't stick to their programs or stick to their membership as well as other types of groups. And actually what we ended up doing was creating a different type of onboarding process for that group um, to help them become more acclimatized to the club and stay within the membership longer. And what it meant was we didn't have to then run that out across every membership. We made it as an offer or an option. You know, if there was a, a female member between the ages 18 and 25 that had never been a member of a club before, for this particular club, we were saying, make sure you say, we have this option, option for you when you join. We also have this option where there's more support. Um, it was a very large club. It was a very sophisticated, club in terms of training approaches and what we found was that just that group of members were struggling to feel like they belonged so we had to do something different so you can break it down by gender and obviously you can start splitting it up then by months in terms of the different types of contracts and you can see a variety of different contracts here 
again, this is Australian data, but and uh, it's still quite common in Australia and in New Zealand to sell 24 month contracts, which isn't something we tend to see so much here in the UK or, or North America anymore. Um, so depending on what variables you've got available, you can split and run these types of retention charts or survival analysis on different variables. Now, what you're looking at here is customers that remember being spoken to or not. And the blue line is customers who do not remember being spoken to. And the red line is customers who do remember being spoken to. And that helps us look at the impact. Now, we could split this by staff. We could split this by club. There's a whole range of things we could then go further on to break this analysis down by. But that just allows us to look at the data and work out where we probably need to take action. Now, there were no dramatic ones here, but we have got a few that I show from time to time, uh, particularly in one club where they lost 60% of their customers within the first two months. 60%. And it, it's just... It amazes me that a business can continue to be successful with that amount of loss. It also amazes me that they're not really working. They weren't prior to me coming in. They weren't really working that hard at trying to change it. So it becomes important that you measure accurately. Survival analysis is the way to do it for this type of between event uh, measurement. So that's between start date and end date, start date and last visit or start date and last payment. Next week, I'm going to look at how you can then use this chart to calculate lifetime value and how you might split that then by membership type, by type of contract, by type of program, so you can see who your most valuable customers are. If you've got any questions relative to retention that you want me to answer, particularly around the data in the analytics, you know, just shoot a, a question into the, into the group and I will get back to you with that. Now, the next thing I want to cover is the behavioral change component for this week's session, and that is cognitive dissonance. And cognitive dissonance is um, this discrepancy between what people say and what they do. And I put it in the, uh, the post coming up for this. You know, you'll notice people saying, I'm the type of person that, and then behaves in a manner contradictory to that statement. Well, you often get people saying losing weight is really important to me, but then you watch their behaviours and it is apparent to me or to you and to them that that isn't necessarily the case. So cognitive dissonance is actually this feeling. It's an internal, uncon uh, and it's an internal level of discomfort created by the difference between what people say and what they do. So it, it creates this internal discomfort. And the way to tackle that is to take action. Now, it was often believed that, actually, you know, and you hear it from time to time, uh, when I get motivated enough, I'll join the gym. When I've got motivated enough, I'll start eating healthy, but I need to get some motivation. Well, when you find somewhere where you can buy motivation, let me know. What we know from research is that actually, if you take action, that actually influences our beliefs and our attitudes. Our attitudes and our beliefs aren't the result of our behaviours or our actions. So what we need to do is don't wait for motivation, get people to take action. In fact, it, it just flies back to what Nike have said forever. Just do it. Just go and do something. Micro actions, baby steps, um, tiny behaviour changes. You know, just a little as put on your trainers and go for a 10 minute walk or a five minute walk. Sometimes they'll even suggest just putting your trainers on to get people to start thinking about what they can do to change the behavior. Now, what we need to do is we need to, in a polite way, in an empathetic way, challenge some of those things. If someone says, oh, I can't, I can't do that. We say, well, Let's see if you can do one minute. Let me see if you can do two minutes. Let's get you started. Taking action is the key to this and reducing this cognitive dissonance. We want to break that pattern. We want to get in the way of this thinking that says, I'm not that type of person. Now, uh, did I do the slide for it? No. Um, for a long time, 
I, I used to draw this wheel, which was uh, beliefs, behaviours, attitudes. And when I did my master's research in exercise psychology, one of the things that we used to look at was, or one of the things I wanted to see was, does um, goal setting predict behaviour? So does planning or mapping out your goals and your visit frequency predict behaviour? And we ran the study, we did it in a, a commercial club um, here in the UK, uh, ran it for about eight to 12 weeks. I think I had about 200 people in the study. What we found at the end was, actually the behaviours predicted the motivation, the motivation didn't predict the behaviour. So we did measure motivation, we used what was called a self-motivation index, um, which unfortunately for me was shown to not be a really strong validated tool, but that wasn't at the time when I was using it. Everyone was using it and I thought it was the appropriate tool. But actually people's behaviour is a better predictor of their beliefs and attitudes than their attitudes. So we want people to, com this is where I'm, I go on all the time about commit to coming twice a week, commit to coming for a certain time, commit to coming at a certain time. Because actually once you start building those routine behaviours into someone's life, actually their belief system starts to change. Their belief system moulds around, I am an exerciser, this is the type of thing I do. I heard a, a really good story one time from someone who said, they went, what would a fit person do? That was the question. Every time they had to make a choice, they go, what would a fit person do? Well, a fit person wouldn't eat that. A fit person wouldn't sit there. A fit person wouldn't uh, get the elevator. They'd walk the stairs. So they kept prompting themselves. Whenever they should, should I, shouldn't I, they asked themselves, what would a fit person do? Or would an exerciser do? And they used that to prompt the behaviour and the action to the point where in the end they just behaved like a fit person and actually they created their own identity within themselves of I am an exerciser, this is the type of thing I would do normally. So that's cognitive dissonance, it's this internal discomfort between what we say we want and what we actually want. So the next thing that came up was um, uh, the ask me anything sections and there was a question in the group saying how can you improve, improve survey results and I made the assumption that this was within a club it wasn't it was actually for a SaaS based product um, so a software based product but my answer would be the same you know improve how do you improve survey response well if you're sending out um, emails or digital surveys couple of things I would do. First of all, I would send out the same survey, but I would use perhaps a couple of different titles for different groups. So I'd actually test and split test between one title for our survey and another title for our survey. One title might say, give us your feedback on the five most important things that uh, you do in the club. There's ne another one might be, uh, this survey takes three minutes to do. Please, can, please complete and submit and see which one gets a response. So that's the first thing I would do. The second thing I would do is I would look at the survey results and I'd want to know what percentage of my customers are responding because you can end up with just a small group responding to your surveys and you get a very skewed picture of what's going on. Now, the second piece of advice I gave, and I actually gave it, I was at a conference. I was fortunate to be at the Anytime Fitness Conference in Australia. Uh, I was sitting on the stage with um, Dave, who's one of the co-founders, Justin Tamsit, who's a really good friend of mine who does the Fitness Business Podcast. Um, and, he's, well, and he's been doing that for years. Um, and then on the other end is uh, Mark Fisher, who runs the most... Um, outrageous personal training fitness facility in New York. Um, it certainly stands out, is probably the easiest way of describing it, from anywhere else I've ever been in my life. But we're all sitting there and someone said, oh, we survey our customers, we send out emails, and we get a five to 10% response. And everybody else on the panel said, yeah, they thought that was a good response, and I agreed. And they said, oh, what could you do to improve the response rate? Um, 
And there wasn't a lot of other answers. And I said, well, I've got something you could do. And what was interesting is the other, my three colleagues are sitting there with me. They lent in. And I, it was really obvious. It was like they were waiting for the answer. And I looked the person directly in the eye and I went, but perhaps what you need to do is just get a clipboard and walk around your club asking customers questions. I said, you don't have to just rely on email surveys. In fact, before email surveys, all surveys were done with paper. And I remember when the clubs I worked in, we'd have boxes of responses that we had to go through and collate and work out. But sometimes doing that, walking the gym floor, walking through the club with a clipboard, doing really quick questionnaires, is a really powerful way of capturing additional data that you don't get through from an electronic survey. It's also a really good way of introducing yourself and interacting with your customers. Now, for the online survey or for the SaaS product, one of the suggestions I made was tell people when they sign up that they'll be surveyed. And I think that's true within clubs as well. I think, you know, if you've got a health club, you can say to people when they join or join their onboarding process, one of the things we do every few months is we send out a survey. The majority of our customers complete that survey. If it comes through, please could you take the time to do it? Now, I am keen that surveys only take minutes, like less five minutes, six minutes maximum to complete. If it takes longer than that to do it, you're going to get a, the longer it takes, the less people are going to complete it or they're going to put, do part way through and then they're going to abandon it. So keep surveys short. But why don't you tell customers we're going to be doing our survey? Why don't you announce it in the club? In three weeks time, we're going to be doing our survey, our annual survey, our quarterly survey, whatever it is, so that people get in mind, oh, I'll keep my eyes open for that. You probably would be able to push that up from perhaps 5 to 10% to 15 to 20%. The rest of the customers, well, they may not be reading your emails. They may not be interested in giving you feedback. They might be happy that with everything as it is, so they don't feel the need to give feedback because they... Sometimes they think actually giving feedback is about negative feedback. So perhaps mix up your surveys with a, um, we're looking for positive comments. We're looking for areas to improve. Do different types of surveys at different times of the year. So that would be surveying. And that was yeah the, the group of us answering those types of questions. Now, the other one, the other question that came up was um, Anushka, who I do know. So someone I, I've known for a while now. And Anushka asked me a question about changing culture. Now, she has commitments at this time, so is not able to join us online. And so what I've said is I will record, we recorded it. She's got her answer. I'm going to share that with you now. So hopefully you enjoy this. It's about six minutes long, just so you know. So Anushka, you, you got in touch, you've got a question. And I believe it's about culture within a business or changing the culture within a business. Yeah, I currently work within a, a gym that has a country club style, but the offering within it and the culture within it doesn't truly reflect that country club and that country club membership. Mm -hmm. So it's how we go about that transition from being a high end gym to being a fully fledged country club culture. OK, so. Within the work that I've done with other operators relative to changing their culture, I think the first thing you have to do is you have to get really clear at the highest levels, the senior management team, of what that culture actually looks like on a day-to-day -day basis. What does it mean when people walk through the door? What does it mean in the way that you communicate with them? How are you going to manage the restaurant bar experience? Because if you want to have that culture, you have to behave in that particular way. So you probably want to get a team of you around and map out what you currently, what the current behaviours are, and then map out what the expected behaviours are. And then obviously just do a gap analysis because you're going to want to be able to think, right, I've got to now communicate this to other members of staff and other colleagues. Now, one of the simplest ways of doing that is to let them have the experience you want them to deliver. So what happens a lot in high-end hotels, places like Ritz-Carlton, um, Four Seasons, when they bring on new members of staff, they'll take them to the restaurant, they'll sit them in the restaurant, and they'll serve them exactly the same way, the types of food, and provide the same service that they expect, or they, they, the guests would normally expect. 
sometimes they'll let them stay in a room overnight. So they've had the experience of staying in the room because one of the challenges with a lot of businesses, the people who are delivering the service have never actually experienced the type of service they're expected to deliver. So if they've worked in a gym environment, they know what the unwritten culture is in terms of, you know, all right, mate, as things, what are you up to, you know, more relaxed conversation. Whereas if you're in a high end culture, you know, the more the country club culture, you've got to think about your language. Um, a friend of mine, Chris Stevenson, talks about luxury language. You know, you don't talk about how the kids, you ask how the children are. Um, how may we help you? Now, that sounds a little bit contrived, but actually the type of customers you're trying to attract and then keep, that's how they're used to being spoken to. They're not used to being spoken to as in a, in a more conversational friendship way. They're, they have an aspiration about the experience they want, and then they expect that service to be delivered up to it. Whether you think they deserve that um, is entirely different from what they expect. So it's it's map out to start with where you are, but it'll be all around the behaviours. And you've got to get your staff on board with what those behaviours look like. And you've got to train them and keep training them. And you've got to catch them doing it right when they do it right. But you've got to pull them up and go, actually, that's not the experience we want to deliver now. The experience is this now. Does that help? Yeah, it does. How do you think if we take that sort of, obviously that experience has to start from the minute their car pulls up, from the minute they walk in the building, and that, that's key and always has been to us. Yeah. But when that filters through to the gym floor, it can often get lost. And again, in classes, again, how do you think the communication there will affect the experience and what things can we look out for in our own behaviours, do you think? OK, so it, there's um, a piece of research done by Google called the zero moment of truth. And the zero moment of truth is what's the actual experience someone gets compared to the experience that was it was designed to be. And I think, you know, you can certainly do the walkthrough of the business with the different teams. So walk the gym staff or the PTs through the business and saying this is what we expect in the restaurant. This is what we expect front of house. So they're seeing that. And then get them, I would get them to talk about, so what do we need to do in our fitness environments to up the level of the game, to distinguish you as being the type of fitness professional that's able to work in this environment compared to perhaps somewhere that isn't a country club, more a traditional gym. Drawing it out from them, they actually then start to set the rules. They start to go, well, I think we should do this and I think we should do that. I would brainstorm it to start with and say, we might not be able to do all of these things, but let's get all these ideas out and written down so that we can see the types of things we're gonna be needing to be doing. Once you've identified perhaps three, maybe five of the maximum, say, right, how do we practice this? How do we make sure people are doing this? Also ask the team how they expect to be checked about those behaviors. So almost let them, and it might sound awful saying it this way, but create the rod for their own back. If Because if they say, well, actually, if I'm not doing it, I want a manager to walk up to me and say, look, I just watched your interaction with that customer. That's not the, the type of interaction we want. You want them to, to be saying that. Then when you have to do it, you say, you know, when we had our meeting, we agreed that this would be the behavior. Now, I know... In the last club that I ran, one of the things that we had as a behavior was whenever a customer came onto the gym floor, any conversation between two members of staff stopped and we focused on the customer. Now, that takes a little bit of practice because most of the time customers will walk onto the gym floor, the two staff will carry on talking. We would stop, turn and welcome the customer, say hello, ask them if there's anything they needed. When we had new members of staff come on board, they might be standing there talking to me. The door opens. I'd actually have to cut them off and go, hang on. So they got used to the fact that every time someone walked on the gym floor, they'd get greeted. And so they have to, you have to demonstrate it and get them to practice it. And then I would say, if I'd shown them that, I'd say, right, next person that comes through the door, you greet them before I greet them. That's, I think, the way of doing it. You've got to give them some level of responsibility for it. You've got to come up with a way of checking it 
that they understand that they're going to get checked against. But it isn't all stick and there is some carrot. So if you see them do it, catch them doing it. You know, so I saw you do that. That's exactly what we want. And if they're not doing it going, I saw that, that looks like it was a lapse back to what we used to do. So it's not a, you're not doing what we wanted. That's what we used to, we're not that anymore. We've moved on. So I'd try and engineer those, those walkthroughs, group meeting, get some collaboration on something, perhaps three to five areas to work on. Because you can always add to that over time. You know, two months in you go, what's another thing we could do? What's another thing we could do? And just keep adding to up their game. Is that That's useful? Right, yeah, it's really useful. Thank you. Any any other final ones? Doesn't have to be. No, I think that's enough to get started with. Okay. Well, look, thank you very much. And uh, thank you. let me know how you get on. Take care. Thank you. So that was me talking to Anushka. Hopefully you found that useful. I've been able to just check the comments while um, uh, we've been on. Oh, that's come up rather large, but it doesn't matter. Ian Davis, good to see you again, mate. Um, is there a difference between people being, you know, where people are in denial and reframing evidence of their beliefs? There's a lot you can do there. What I'll do is I'll um, pull together some content about reframing. Why? Why? You turn your phone off and it starts to ring. Um, sorry about that. Uh... Yeah, I'll pull some stuff together. Reframing, really important topic. Um, I think also the the other thing I would focus on here is I would focus on uh, what I call pattern interrupts. Pattern interrupts is where you someone says, oh, "I'm not the type of person that could," and then you say something that makes them think, "Well, what if I, you know, or well, what if you could do that? What would that be like?" Um, so you can certainly interrupt people's patterns within behavior change often you need to establish empathy you need to build rapport but you also need to have a structure of how you're going to have that conversation if you're not so familiar with taking people through behavior change sessions it is actually really useful to have a structure when you do it a lot it can be done much more conversationally the other comment that came in and this will be really large again so um and this is um, Mark's comment around um, when we're talking about setting values, the, the importance of values. And I agree with that. Values, if you want to change a culture, you've got to have clear values. I think often the challenge is, when I look at businesses, when you look at what their values are, you can't take action on them. You can't, you know, or you say, how are you going to show honesty? How are you going to show innovation? And quite, quite a lot of values I don't feel are actually useful to businesses when you actually get down to the nitty gritty. They sound great when you've got missions, vision and values, but actually the action of or what you can, what staff can do to fulfill those values can often be really difficult to see. Um, look, that's it for today. If you've got other questions, please forward them. I'm always happy to ask your questions. I want to ask your answer your questions. Um, it makes me think. It sometimes takes me out of my comfort zone. Thank you for attending today, and I will see you next week.